Well, let's pray. Let's pray and start get started up, guys. Father God, thank you for tonight. God, I pray over our hearts and over our minds tonight. I know we've all had long weeks, and uh, I just pray that you make us fertile soil, Lord, so that we can put the words of your of your Bible into our lives and let it produce fruit. Um, don't let us be see. Don't let our seeds be thrown on the rocky path or in the thorns. But let it let us be fertile soil for you, Father. I pray over tonight. Let me be. Let me just say the words that you would have me to say. And it's in your Son's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Cool. So tonight, as you can probably guess, we're going to talk about not what we are going to study. It, it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, so I know we're going through. Matthew basically kind of using it as a road map to go through prophecies in the Old Testament But I, I think we just need to take a break from that just for this week and Because I'm pulling verses especially last time I taught we're pulling verses from all over the Bible, right? And I you know, I want to provide some clarity to that and I want to give us all some peace on how I'm studying the Bible and I want to give you guys some tips so, so that you can study the Bible in a better way hopefully and encourage you to study it in a in the good in a good way. And uh, if there's ever to be any accountability with this Wednesday night service, we've all got to hold fast to what is true, and we kind of have to have the same measuring stick, don't we? I mean, if y'all want, if I want to hold you accountable to the words of God, and you want to make sure that I'm preaching accurately and, and true to God's word, we, we need to have a measuring stick here. And we need to be on the same page about this. And so instead of tonight, instead of what we're going to study, I'm going to tell you how. <laughs> At the very least, how I study. And um, hopefully I can give you a fishing rod instead of a fish. <laughs> and we can all fish together. And if I say anything out of line, Joyce can let me know. <laughs> so I know there's a lot of people who believe, as I did at one point in my life, um, that being led by the Spirit is basically opening the Bible and doing the move. You ever done that? Got, I got my pointy Bible picture up here. Find a random verse, and uh, what happens is you open that up, boom, you find your verse, and it says... Then Judas hung himself. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that must have been me. That, that wasn't the spirit. That wasn't the spirit. Let's try again. So you flip again. Boom, this is it. Go and do likewise. Oh, man. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> we, uh, you see, we, we have to understand that in the Bible, a noun is a noun. A verb is a verb. And, and, and our experience with the, Holy, with the Holy Spirit in our lives, can God use that? Sure. He can use that if he wants. I just want you to understand that that's not the most reliable way for God to speak to you through his word. Holy Spirit can use anything he wants, right? But when we use the Bible that way, it, it leaves us open to being incredibly wrong. Go hang yourself. That's not good, <laughs> right? And so... Our experience with God and our experience with the Holy Spirit doesn't invalidate the Holy Spirit in the life of Moses when he wrote the first five books of the Old Testament in the Spirit. It doesn't invalidate uh, David, King David, when he wrote the Psalms. It doesn't invalidate Paul when he wrote letters to all the churches. We need to understand that they were writing in the Spirit. Does that mean that we don't read in the Spirit? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is if we are coming to a conclusion that's different than what they are trying to teach us, then <laughs> what are we doing? What is that? Is it the Holy Spirit or is it just us? And we need to learn how to differentiate between these things and, and, and be strong. So in order to do that, I, I kind of put together a little two or three minute video. Dad, you're going to love this, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> you know, kill me afterwards. And uh, I, want, I want us to see a good example of what not to do. <laughs> yeah. 
So this is a couple, a few minutes long. Oh, and pardon me, there's a, there's a watermark on it, and uh, I had to download a free program because I don't have a video editing program. But it goes away in about 30 seconds. Oh, glory. If you ever want to get anything done, I protest. <laughs> there ought to be a law. It's easy to drink Dr. Pepper. You love it. Dr. Pepper, man. You can keep going. And I will bring you Dr. Pepper. I want you to leave your father's house. Leave where you are. Leave everything behind. Take your Dr. Pepper. Your Dr. Pepper. Your Dr. Pepper. And leave. We got to have, man. We got to have what we want. We don't get it. I mean, what are we going to do? Get me out of here. I got to go somewhere where they got Dr. Pepper, man. At that time, Abraham had no Dr. Pepper. He simply took up everything and left to show him a land and bring him to a place. The good old days of Dr. Pepper and ice cream, that would be his. He believed it so much. It so filled his heart, it so filled his mind. He was so taken with Dr. Pepper. But God called Dr. Pepper to burn within Abraham. We went to a restaurant here a few Sundays ago and they didn't have any Dr. Pepper. You should have seen the look on my face. <laughs> Brother, look out. That just ain't right. There ought to be a law. You mean you ain't got no Dr. Pepper here, man? I mean, I was happy and talking and everything going good. And they said, what'd you like to drink, Dr. Pepper? We ain't got none. <laughs> oh, no. What am I going to do now? We have Pepsi, oh, okay. <laughs> I'll settle for a Pepsi. <laughs> you may not always get Dr. Pepper, but stick with God. Take Pepsi <laughs> and be thankful. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you blessed? Are you really blessed? Yes. Well, turn around and shake somebody's hand and say, I am really, 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 really. I'm really, 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 really. I'm really blessed. Dr. Pepper, man. Yeah. I love you. Is anybody thirsty? <laughs> oh, yeah, he is gonna. <laughs> oh, man. So, we <laughs> feels like we just watched an advertisement for Dr. Pepper, didn't it? <laughs> so we know, we know, we were, most of us were there. My dad, th that wasn't a sermon on how good Dr. Pepper was, was it? <laughs> was it? No. But it was funny. But it, but it made me feel good. It made me laugh. And I love Dr. Pepper. Well, feeling good and loving Dr. Pepper doesn't give us the right to change his words. Does it? To take parts of his words and make this whole sermon about Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Uh, well, if we have that kind of respect for his words, for dad's words, then we should have a thousand times more respect for God's words. Should we not? 
right? We can't take words from all over the place and make them say what you want because it doesn't, it, it becomes you at that point, doesn't it? It doesn't, it, you're using the words in the Bible, but it's really you. So tonight I want to talk about three things. No, it's not a three-point sermon. Kind of is, but there's a lot of points within those points. So, you know, don't worry. We're going to be here a while, Joyce. It's okay. <laughs> My three points here tonight, I want to talk about why we should follow any kind of rules at all when we study the Bible. Why? Why study rules? I think this is a pretty good start, right? It kind of gets the point across real quickly. And two, what are the rules of biblical interpretation that we should be following? And how should we go about agreeing and disagreeing with one another once we get all of these principles down? Because we, uh, you know, we got to deal with that. So, one, I, I want to talk about why we should follow these rules in the first place. Um, it, it's, it's a simple concept to, to have to follow certain rules while, as you're studying the Bible, but it's actually really <laughs> difficult to follow. And it's really important. Um, there's a battle going on in our culture. I know you guys know them all. <laughs> and before you jump in your mind to all these, every single political battle we've got to fight, I just want you to think about one. And I think it's the most important one. And this battle isn't unique to our country, and it's not unique to our time period. It has been a battle that we faced ever since the Garden in Adam and Eve, um, and it's, a, you know, when, when Satan gave a promise to Eve, you will surely not die. You won't surely die. You'll become like God, right? It's something in our human nature that we crave to be like God. And it's the question that Pilate posed to Jesus in the trial in John 18. What is truth? What is truth? Do we realize that all of these issues going on in our culture really boil down to what is truth? Do you get to change truth? Do you get to dictate truth? In, in my generation especially, there's a popular phrase. You have your truth and I have my truth. You've probably heard that, haven't you, Sarah? You're younger than I am. That's probably a whole thing. You have your truth, you know. That's your truth, not my truth. And we have to understand this way of thinking is it doesn't really have any interest in what truth actually is or what reality actually is. That's not why people say that. They use the word truth, but they mean something else. What, rather, it's a really subtle way of saying there is no such thing as objective truth, only experience, only my experience. And this, and from what I can tell from all my liberal friends, which I've got a ton of them, um, they, they pose this as open-mindedness, when really, I mean, as soon as you close yourself off to the possibility of objective truth, you, you close yourself off to reason, to logic, to, to being mentored by anybody, uh, to, to, to have the ability to be corrected by anybody. Um, you can't be guided. You, you can't be mentored. And and, and the reason is, is because nobody can really understand your experience but you. You know? Um, and the, the way that you can tell if somebody has experienced what you have experienced is if they're saying the same things you are. Right? You, you start under, you, they say, well, I agree with everything you say. Yeah, 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 They're, these people are horrible, and that's horrible, and this is wonderful, and that's, oh, you sound exactly like me. You, I believe that you experienced the same things I did. Whether it's true or not is irrelevant. The fact is, they just want to create a culture in which everybody agrees with each other. And they say experience is their teacher, and a lot of the times, you know, it's, it's really what it is, is their perception of, experiences in the world. And as long as you agree with what I'm saying, you must have experienced the same things. And that's true. We make that true. <laughs> that's just a veneer. Um, there, it, it's so, you cannot get more close-minded than that. You really can't. Because when you do that, 
when, when your whole experience and all of your culture is based on everybody's worldview that, that everything that you agree on is what makes your culture, it's incredibly difficult to reason with anybody like that who, believe, who actually believes this way. Um, and it's because they will always default to this idea that their experience in life overrides any logical proposal from an opposing view. You can't, it's hard to reach people like that. It's not impossible. But it is difficult to have those conversations because every time you make a good point, they say, yeah, but that's your truth. I'm like, okay, here we go again. <laughs> right back in the circle. Oh man, it's so, it's so tough. Um, as followers of Christ, I think we should all agree that we should not conform to this way of thinking. We, we as believers in Christ, we have a north star, right? That's, that's the Holy Spirit, that's the Bible, and we only know Jesus and the Holy Spirit through the Bible. <laughs> the Bible is our north star here. And it's the same north star for everyone who believes. It's not your, your north star, oh, okay, well, yeah, that's your experience in Christ, and I have my experience in Christ, and you come to two different... We can't be like the world, guys. We cannot be that way. The truth in the Bible, there is one meaning to certain verses. It's our job to figure out what that meaning is. That's how we search it out. Now, just because we follow Christ... And, and we want to know objective truth, that doesn't mean that we're immune to this way of thinking sometimes. Sometimes we slip into it. And we don't mean to. Um, it's really easy, however innocently it may be, to that's exactly what you're doing when you start cherry-picking verses to make a point that you, through your experience, know is true. It validates your thinking when you do that. When you say, okay, I know this to be true through my experience, and now I'm going to pull all of these verses, you're convincing yourself of a lie, sometimes. Now, does this mean that all of our experiences mean nothing? No, absolutely not. Of course our experiences mean things, but our, our experiences can teach us a lot, but without, without logic and reason being that guide to us, then our own experiences have the potential to pose as wisdom, but can actually just be a, 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 a very shallow veneer of self-worship. Where if you're cherry-picking things in order for you to make the Bible sound exactly like you want it to sound, you're worshiping yourself. So it is a serious issue, is what I'm trying to get at. Uh, boy, we went from funny to serious real fast, didn't we? We didn't even get past the intro. This idea of self-worship, every single cult that's ever been formed, they do this. They use the Bible, they twist it, and they find vulnerable, weak, and uneducated people and target them and try to give them some sort of fulfillment that's actually not Christ. It's, it's either community or, you know, whatever it is. But it's not fulfilling and it's not lasting. We need to stay away from doing this. Um, This is why we have to learn how to interpret the text of Scripture in a genuine and, and earnest way, where we're allowing Scripture to mold and shape us and not the other way around. We do not mold and shape Scriptures. And it's this way that I want to encourage us to fight our spiritual battles using truth and our own self-repentance as our weapons, not emotion in condemning other people. You see, as I thought about what I'm teaching tonight, it, this is, I'm going to tell you something. This is my opinion. I didn't read this in the Bible anywhere. Uh, actually, there is nowhere in the Bible that says, this is how you study ancient texts. <laughs> so a lot of this is just, it's, it's, uh, they teach it in seminary. There's a lot of smart people who follow these rules, but tonight is a weird kind of Bible study. I'll tell you that. So for me, I'm going to tell you my opinion here. I think it's more impactful to see a person that repents than it is for somebody trying to know their stuff and get me to follow their way of thinking. Um, 
like, wow, you know, you're so smart. Well, I'm going to have to think about that. I'm going to have to, you know, I'm going to have to come to that on my own. But when you see a drug dealer give up his entire life in thousands upon thousands of dollars a week, and he says, I'm going to follow Christ, <laughs> that hits you. That hits me. And so let us be people, a people who, when we think of war, if we're in the kingdom of God, we, get, we can't think of it the same way that, that the world thinks. When we think of war, we need to go to war with our own sins. And studying the Bible is a good place to start. Studying the Bible the right way, we need to be constantly repenting. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells a parable um, of the seeds, seed in the sower. Everybody knows that one, right? Um, later in the chapter, uh, Jesus' disciples ask him to explain it, explain the parable. And so let's, let's read. Let's read Matthew 13 together. I'm going to start in verse 18 through 23. This is where Jesus is explaining the parables, and I want to point out a couple of things. It says, Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. Anyone who hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, and doesn't understand it. He's talking about not just hearing it, and this is different than doing it. He talks about hearing it and doing it in other places, but here he wants us to, what? Understand it. Then the wicked one, he doesn't understand it. The wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one who receives the seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed in a stony place, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now, he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, deceitfulness, they're deceived. This also has to do with your savvy here, you, you, the way you exercise your logic in your mind. And the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And he becomes unfruitful, not bearing any fruit. But he who receives the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and what? And understands it. Who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And so, you know, I love the parable of the seeds and sower. And you can get so much, you could talk t ten sermons out of that one thing of scripture right there, but I want us to understand that it was important to Jesus for us not to just hear his word, but understand it. And as a matter of fact, he spoke in parables so that the Pharisees and the religious people who, who felt they were too righteous to talk to him, um, they didn't understand what he was saying, and he, they didn't get the explanation. It was the sinners, <laughs> right? It was the people who were humble enough to ask him what it meant. He gave them understanding. We need to understand that hearing the words is not enough to bear fruit. We have to understand what he's saying as well. When the, when the Protestant church split from the Roman Catholic church, there became a great need to be responsible for your own interpretation of Scripture. Um, instead of relying on the papacy, the pope, the bishops, and all these people to, to dictate to you their interpretation of, of Scripture, it fell upon the individual. That's great. I'm, I'm very happy about the Reformation. It's great. It's awesome. <laughs> However, with all of this freedom that we have, without taking responsibility for understanding how to study it, it, it can be harmful. Not only to us, but it can be harmful to other people that we try to teach. Um, it made me think of this, it, all of the, chapter 23, if that doesn't make you shake in your boots, I don't think anything will. And it's all of these woes that Jesus is saying to the scribes and Pharisees. Well, there's this one. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. Proselyte is like a disciple. Uh, they're trying to convert you to their way of thinking. You travel land and sea to, to win one disciple, one proselyte. And when he's one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. That's pretty rough. That's, that's harsh language. <laughs> but he is saying that 
because you, are, you went and taught these people, and now think about it, these people that you, they saved, these people that they brought over to their way of thinking, they not only, they see the word through their interpretation as well, right? And they look up to them, and obviously they converted them, so they have respect for them. Anyways, it, it, gets, it gets rough when you don't study the right way, and you're not preaching actually the true truth of the Bible. So now, we can get started. <laughs> no, wait. we're going to get into the meat, though. This is the meat. Let's, move, let's do it. What are the rules that we need to be following to interpret the Bible correctly? And uh, there's a term for the, for the art or the science of interpretation. Does anybody know it? Boom. Who said that? Is that you? Hermeneutics. I was like, dude, never met you before, but you know, you know some words. Hermeneutics isn't, isn't very... Uh, <laughs> so hermeneutics, you're going to hear that if you, if you start studying this subject of how to study the Bible. Um, it's good to know that term because there's going to be a lot of studious academics that throw that word around, uh, hermeneutics. It's just, it's just the science of how to study the Bible. Not even just the Bible, ancient texts, modern texts, just written literary texts. That's what it means. I think I threw it up here on the next slide. Yeah, if you want to write down what that means, it could be helpful. And uh, I'm right here, I, I, I want to reiterate, there is, no script, there is no teaching in Scripture about this, of you should study the Bible this way or, this, or thus. Um, if, you, if you look it up, Everybody has their own, it's, it seems like everybody has their own list. I listened to so many sources this week to try to figure out and narrow the list that, I'm going, that I was going to share with you. Some people have 10 points on their list, some people have four, some people have seven. Um, but truly, like when you break it down, it seems like they're all saying a lot of the same things. There's certainly the same heart behind it. And... Some people break what some per person would put into one point. They break it up into two or three points to get more intricate. The study of hermeneutics, it can be as simple or as complicated as you want it to get. It was, a t it was tough to get this teaching ready. I'm not going to lie. Because it's, you know, it's not directly in the Bible. It's, not, you know, it's, it's one of those, there, are, there is room for how you do it, but there's also rules you don't need to be breaking. <laughs> it's tough. Um, so you may, you know, you're going to hear this word. Um, I don't want you to think of these rules. I keep thinking, I keep saying rules. I don't want you to think of them as this legalistic control. I don't want you to think of it as a control mechanism. I, I, I would rather think of this Consider this freedom from the deceitfulness of our own hearts and the ability to discern bad teaching when you hear it. Um, we, ha we have to be able to do those things. What, is, what does the Bible tell us about our own hearts? Desperately wicked. <laughs> we can't trust our emotions. We can't trust our feelings. We have to stick to some rules, and that gives us genuine freedom. Because if we don't have freedom in Christ, that just leads us to be a slave to sin. That's it. You can be a slave of Christ, a slave to sin. So, within hermeneutics, I want to point out three things within this realm of thinking. Hermeneutics. And, and hopefully this can make us a lot stronger in our theologies and, and in our faith. Um, this is why I'm here on Wednesday nights. This is why I'm here. I want to help make you strong. I want us to be soldiers. We have to be strong in this culture. It's, uh, most of us understand, especially if we're not around Christians all the time, that there is a very real battle <laughs> happening, and we need to be strong. And that means in our logic, as well as prayer warriors, and, and all of these things. But a lot of the times, this subject tonight gets tossed aside because it is hard to study. It is hard to teach on. It is hard to think about. But we need to. 
And I want to I want to tell you that this subject is really vast, and uh, there's a lot smarter men than me that can go into a lot more detail than I'm going to go into tonight. Um, at the end, I will I can make you recommendations on people you should go listen to, and it was really really cool to hear. I mean, I listened to about five sermons this week just on this subject, and it was fantastic. I mean, it's just really good. I'm not going to go into as much detail as some people will, because I don't have a semester to do that. <laughs> so I'm going to do as much as I can tonight. Um, at the at the end of this teaching, I I hope you can at least get a taste for it, and you can go and and dig deeper into it yourself. And I will too. I'm I'm going to try to keep digging deeper into it. So a couple terms. Uh, there's three things that I really want to point out in this, and that is exegesis versus eisegesis. These two terms are really important to learn. And it's not just the terms, it's the concepts behind them. Um, I want to talk about understanding what context is, understanding context in the scriptures, and how to, and how to use the Bible to interpret the Bible. That should be our first resource. So, so one... Exegesis versus eisegesis. I hope I got this right. Yeah, here we go. So, exegesis literally means to draw out. And, and some people just think of it as, what is the author's intent? Whoever wrote what you're reading, what are they trying to get across? What are they trying to portray in their message? Um, whether it's, you know, Paul, Matthew, Peter, Isaiah, Moses... What did they mean when they said what they said? Um, and in opposition to that, we have eisegesis, which is to, to take your interpretations of what the world is like in 2023 in America and put them on the text as though they were written for us. Now, we have to be careful because it's, of course, you can take as many apple, you can, you can read the same verse 20, 30, 50 times and get a new application in your life every time you read it. But it only has one meaning. A lot of applications that you can apply to your life, but the meaning doesn't change. It stays the same. And that is, that meaning that we're trying to understand and get to is what does the author mean when he says this or that? Right? Um, a quick example of this um, is in Psalms 22, this is like a, I don't know, this is a pretty light example of it. But in Psalm 22, David is speaking prophetically about the death of Christ. And he uses this picture to describe what's happening to him. And it says, My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. Well, in modern society, we, we don't use clay pots for anything more than decoration, really, or for some kind of hobby when you go and make it, you know, in the spinning class or something. Um, but when this was written, clay pots were used to store food, to cook food, to transport water, um, tons of other things. They used it as a light source at an end of a stick <laughs> to help, like a, like, a, like a torch. They used clay for everything. It was so popular. Um, the definition of a pot shirt to the people when David wrote this, they would have known exactly what it meant. To us, it's kind of like pots are made out of steel. <laughs> you know, pots are made, you know, we got, we got all kinds of stuff that our pots are made of now. We don't automatically think clay, you know. Um, Clay pots were so common in the ancient world that they had entire fields dedicated to, it's like junkyards, but just for clay pots, just for clay, just to throw it over there, just to get it out of the way. Um, when clay pots were used for a long time, pieces of it would start to dry and, and break or flake off, and this is referred to as a pot shirt, just a little bitty piece of the pot that breaks off. And the meaning would be really obvious. It means that this person that David is talking about is used up. His strength is used up. It's coming towards the end of his life. 
when, when the pot breaks too much and you start getting holes in there, you just got to throw it away. It's not useful anymore. So a pot shirt, my strength is dried up like a pot shirt. It means that he's getting, uh, there's no more left in him. He's getting used up. Um, and so that's just, that's just one little example. And, and in the Bible, there's a lot more, <laughs> a ton more things we're going to run into that's like, huh, that sounds odd to me. And the reason it sounds odd is because it was written 2,000, 4,000 years ago. Um, and we need to understand that. If you keep this idea in your mind of the author's intent, it will change the way you study and understand Scripture in the best way possible. You, you'll stop being confused on a lot of things. Um, When you figure out one ancient uh, tradition or ancient cultural thing, you'll start seeing it in other places too. It's okay. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard, but just like any other job in the whole entire world, it's hard at first. But when you start practicing things the right way, it becomes second nature. It becomes easier. So don't get discouraged, you know, um, about studying the Bible. This is more difficult than just, it's way more difficult than that. But it should be. And it's worth it. Let's talk about understanding context. I don't know if anybody's heard this, but the phrase context is king, or a lot of pastors will say context, context, context. It's, it's important. It is important. It's hugely important. Well, when it comes to biblical interpretation, anyways. To understand something in its context in which it was written is the backbone of searching for truth, and understanding the author's intent of whatever you're reading. Um, twisting, twisting people's teachings out of context, taking them out of context, has been a problem for a long time. It, it was a problem all the way back at the very beginning of the New Testament. Did, did you know that Peter actually read Paul's writings while he was alive? It's interesting to think about, isn't it? That, and he didn't just read it, he commented on it in one of his letters, in Second Peter. In Second Peter, he, Peter is talking about Paul's writings here, and it says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent and be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, yes, our Paul, the Paul that wrote most of the New Testament, according to his wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles or letters, speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So, even Peter, when you're reading Romans, or you're reading Galatians, or reading something that Paul wrote, if you're like, dang, this is, this is really hard to get, you know, um, don't worry. <laughs> you're in good company. Peter thought the same thing when he read Paul's writings. He's like, wow, this guy is smart. Um, and it's incre it is sometimes getting into the de depths of his writings is really difficult. Um, not impossible. There's a lot of smart people who have figured that out for us. And, you know, anyways. So how do, how do we understand this context, what we're reading, and avoid this idea of twisting scripture? Um, under this category of context here, I want to talk about four different practices, or four different things that can help you uh, get into the right mindset when you go in to study the Bible. The, these four things are not all-encompassing rules. You know, These aren't hard and fast. These aren't like, this is what... You have to do. These are four things that I think, if you put these into practice, it can really help you in your understanding of Scripture. And not only that, uh, this can help you understand how I study Scripture. And you'll you'll know that what I'm teaching you is this is this is what I'm doing, <laughs> at the very least. So to get into this idea of context, we need to be mindful of what the Bible is. The whole Bible, what is it? 
the overall context of the Holy Scriptures. In a nutshell, is that the Bible is a collection of scrolls that were written over the course of thousands of years by approximately 40 different people. It was written in different cultures that are not only thousands of miles away from Benton, Arkansas, but they're also thousands of years removed from 2023. Think about this. How different is our culture right now in America than when the Civil War was taking place? This is an actual colorized picture that they took, by the way. I love stuff like that. How different is that? Look at those wagons back there. This was 162 years ago. That's it. Just 162 years ago. Or think about when Christopher Columbus sailed his ship, the Santa Maria, when, when he found the Americas. That happened 531 years ago. The New Testament was written about 2,000 years ago. The New Testament. <laughs> right? In a Jewish culture under Roman rule. And the events of the Exodus, for instance, happened in Egypt around 3,400 years ago. 3,400 years ago. Throughout Scripture, you're going to encounter different languages in which the Bible was written, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek. Understanding the Bible in an accurate way is not an easy task, and it should not be made into an easy task. Does that mean you need to go learn Aramaic? No. <laughs> that would be ridiculous, right? We can, we can understand certain things. There are certain reliable commentaries of men who have dedicated their lives to these things. And we can find things that are trustworthy. So context. Within this idea, I want to I point out three things. You need to start by understanding each individual word of the sentence you are reading. As, as Bible scholars, we're not scholars, but we're going to try to be anyways. We need to be really good with understanding words. Understanding that this was written in a different language, we need to find what those words are and first start there. Um, figure out what these individual words mean. Then afterwards, you move on to the sentence. After the sentence, the paragraph. After the paragraph, the book or the chapter. And after the chapter, the entire book or letter. Because these, these things that we're reading have overarching messages. Say the book of Romans. Yes, there are points that he makes within each individual uh, section. But overall, every chapter has a point to it. And the entire book is pointing towards a, a, an actual point, one point. The same with all the epistles. And so we can't just take uh, parts of it and try to pretend like the whole book is about this, unless it actually is. <laughs> There's a few verses that are pinpointed to, like the climax of the whole book is there. But we can't do that with every single verse. Um, just a few days ago, I had, had a conversation with a buddy and we were talking about what it means to walk in the Spirit and what it means to grieve the Spirit. And he even said it. He was quoting it to me. Yeah, grieve not the Spirit. Don't grieve the Spirit. And I said, do you know what that means? <laughs> um, and even for myself, for a lot of my life, I just thought it meant don't hold back the Spirit from working in your life. Don't hold him back. Well, that's not what that means. What, what, you can look up in the, in the Greek, which is what it was written in. That word means to make sorrowful, uh, to affect with sadness or to offend. That means don't make the Holy Spirit sad. Well, that's different, isn't it? That's a whole different idea of what the Holy, who the Holy Spirit is. That means the Holy Spirit has feelings, like a person. Because he's a person. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is his very own entity. He is not uh, something that you can do and control him. This is, this is another personhood of the Trinity. 
is what the Holy Spirit is. And you can make him sad. You can make him happy. He has an opinion. He's not a computer program. You can get all that from the word grieve. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. Computer programs don't feel sad. But he's a person. He's, a, he's a part of the Trinity, the Godhead. And so, and so on and so forth. Uh, the understanding of a word can lead you to, to understand the meaning of the entire sentence in which it's saying, and the entire chapter, and the entire book. And so we have to be, uh, we have to be mindful of those things. The next thing I want to consider is to try to, try to put yourself into the story you're reading. If it's a narrative, try to, use, try to use your imagination and put yourself there. That's why I like using pictures like this. This is on top of Mount Sinai. The, the rocks in the front are burnt. It's not a shadow. Um, this is where God came down on Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia on the mountain of Jabal Allah's. Absolutely, I think it's there. All the evidence points towards it. So these rocks here are burnt. And what you're looking at out that way, there's this little patch over there is where the altar where the burnt cat or where the golden calf was set up. And behind that, all of that field is where they camped. This is where the Israelites encamped in front of Mount Sinai. Well, when you see this, instead of like a cute little picture book we saw when we were growing up as kids, you know, it helps you close your eyes and you realize, whoa, I would have been scared too. That's a big mountain. When, Jesus, when God comes down on that mountain, it starts shaking and thundering and the whole, it feels like an earthquake. I'd be shaking in my boots too. <laughs> Definitely. We say, oh man, you know, they went through the Red Sea. How could they want water? How could they think God would let them thirst to death? Look at that. I would. I'd be scared. <laughs> Ain't no water. There's no water source there. They were thirsty. The idea of the split rock and the water coming out of the rock was probably every bit as miraculous to them as the crossing of the Red Sea because their lives depended on it both times, didn't it? Pharaoh was going to kill them, and they were going to thirst to death. Both times, God miraculously provides for them. And when you see where it happened... It makes it easier to, to understand the context of everything, of what you're reading. Um, I want to talk about what we learned. I'm going to bring us back to, to high school for a minute. The five W's. Do we remember that? What's up, Sarah? You, you're laughing about high school. You're still in high school. The five W's. Does anybody remember what they are? There's a lot of W's heading this way. Whoa, 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 whoa. So we're going to talk about them. Who, when, where, what, why. We can talk about who. Who's telling the story? Who is the person telling the story to? Or who wrote the letter? And who were they writing the letter to? Who's this letter, letter and story about? When, did, when was this written? What time period was this written about? About So you've got Moses writing about things that happened four, five, six hundred years before him, right? So not only when did they write it, which is useful for prophecy, right? We've, we've talked about that. But what time period are they writing about? Um, where? Where was this written? Where did they write the letter? A lot of the letters that Paul wrote were from prison. That's significant. When you think about 2 Timothy... It's the last letter they believe Paul wrote before he was executed. His last will and testament. When you understand the context, you kind of hone in and pay attention a little bit more. Right? Like, these are Paul's last words. He must have meant what he said. What? What was the message or purpose that the author intended to get across to the audience? What was their message all about? You can understand that better when you understand the first three W's. And then the last W, I put why at the end, because you can't really truly understand why until you understand all the other stuff. Why did they write what they wrote? Um, why did they point out certain details? Why did they omit certain details? That's important. 
When you answer all these questions about a certain passage of Scripture, then you can more accurately use your imagination and, uh, and put yourself there. Um, a few weeks ago, my dad talked about being inside of Noah's Ark. This is a good example of that. Um, putting yourself in the story. Who were the characters in the story of the Ark? What did it smell like? You ever thought about that? How long were they in the boat? What did they do while they were in the boat? What is it like to see the door shut and sealed when you didn't do it? What were their jobs? Where did the poop go? We had a great conversation about that, didn't we? <laughs> um, all these questions are absolutely worth thinking about. And when you do this, anybody who's ever been to seminary um, will tell you that you start seeing the Bible in color and instead of just black and white. You can start seeing things in color, and it really starts to stick into your memory and your soul. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And, and it's, uh, when you're putting yourself in here in, into the stories, I had, I had a little note here. Don't let your inferences, meaning it's not actually in the text, you're just inferring that it was there. Um, don't let your inferences trump what was plainly written in the text. So don't let your imagination trump what it actually says, ever. Um, the third thing you need to think about is the different literary styles that the Bible was written in. Um, and you can't read these all the same way. You can't interpret them all the same way. Some of the Bible is laws and rules like Leviticus. Um, you've got a historical narrative which makes up like I think it's like over half of the Bible or something like that. Most of it is narrative form. Um, you've got poetry and songs, like the Songs of Solomon. Uh, you have Proverbs, like Proverbs. <laughs> you've got letters, like all of, the, all of the writings that Paul wrote, the epistles. Um, you have parables, and then you have prophecy. It's important to recognize the differences between all of these because you, shouldn't, you really shouldn't read them the same. Um, if you're trying to read something as a narrative that actually happened, like uh, Exodus and the children of Israel and all of the things that happened in, in that, it's very narrative form. And then you can't go to Revelations and say there was a huge scroll that went up into the sky. Well, if you read those literally, people are like, well, it was a bomb, it's an A-bomb. And, and, you know, it's this or that. It's like, no, if you're going to read it all the same, then it's a scroll. <laughs> you know, people say, you know, these, uh, the uh, giant locusts with the faces of men in Revelation, they come down. Well, I've heard a lot of people say, well, you know, you read it literally, then it's, uh, it's got to be a, a Apache helicopters. It's definitely what it is. I'm like, well, if you're going to read it literally, then it's giant locusts with the faces of people. You can't read, you can't read all of these the same. And understanding the differences will, will certainly help provide clarity to your Bible study. We under, we, I want to say this, too. We do understand that each and every individual author of this Bible, we do need to understand that first and foremost, but we do, we do understand that there is an overall author, <laughs> and that is God, that is the Holy Spirit. Jesus attributed, attributed David's writings to the Holy Spirit, that David wrote these things in the Spirit, and he pointed that out often. And so there is this overall, but we can't understand what the Holy Spirit is doing unless we understand the immediate context of which it's being written. Um, the idea of Isaac and Abraham, I, I really don't think uh, that when Moses was writing that down, he was like, all right, the Messiah is going to come and die and resurrect for us. I honestly don't think he, he, he knew. There's plenty of times, like uh, Daniel, in the book of Daniel, he's got these visions that God gives him about you know, all of these weird, strange things, and he says, I don't know what that means. If anybody understands it, <laughs> I hope you get it. And so even, even him, sometimes the Holy Spirit is the author, but we do need to understand the context immediately of which it was written. Let's see. 
going on a tangent there. So yeah, those are the three points that I want to talk about on context. Um, understand your words, sentences, paragraphs, chapters, books. Understand the five W's when you're reading things and, uh, and keep things in the context of which they're written. So, now that we've talked about exegesis and context, let's talk about how do we use the Bible to interpret the Bible. Um, we do this on Wednesdays a lot. Um, you may not notice it, or you may not realize it. You probably will now. Um, but I, I want to say this. Before we crack open any other commentaries or testimonies or spiritual guidance books or devotionals or anything, all of those are fine, and, they're, and those are good. But our first and foremost commentary needs to be the Bible itself. And there's plenty of commentary in there. Um, for instance, in John 5, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. I'll throw it up here. Um, he says, Do not think that I shall accuse you to your father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Jesus is saying, the first five books of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, those are about me. They're about the Messiah. That's a commentary, is it not? I want to look at Matthew 12. And he says, uh, Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. We want to see a miracle. But he answered them and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was, in, was three days and nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will raise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. So Jesus is saying, when you read the book of Jonah, that's about the Messiah. That's about me. Um, we need to, it doesn't matter what any other commentary on the planet says. If Jesus says, look in the book of Jonah and you're going to see me there, we need to trust that and we need to be looking for him <laughs> in the story of Jonah. Uh, one more example. We used this uh, when I taught about Abraham and Isaac a few weeks back. Um, you can go to Hebrews 11 and there's a commentary on that. And by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able even to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figure, figurative sense. So we've got the author of Hebrews commenting on the story in Genesis 12, right? Or 22, sorry, Genesis and so we didn't get that. It didn't say that in Genesis. It didn't say, Abraham was thinking, ah, if, even if I kill him, God will raise him back from the dead. It doesn't actually say that, but Hebrews said that. And we can trust that because it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Use commentaries. Use them. Use them. I'm not discouraging you from using them. We need them. I use them all the time. There are men who dedicated their entire lives to just one book of the Bible, and we would be fools not to listen to what they have to say. So yes, listen to commentaries, read commentaries, those are good, but read the Bible first. And if those commentaries come in contradiction with anything you're reading in the Bible, then, then uh, maybe seek a dif different source. There's, there's wisdom in numbers, okay? So, let's see. Oh, yeah. This is kind of a bonus point, and it doesn't really have to do with, with really studying. It's more of a mindset that we should have, I think. It's this idea that it, if the Bible speaks, then speak. And if the Bible is silent on something, then be silent. And it's okay to be silent. It's okay. We don't have to have an opinion on every little bitty thing. If the Bible, if the Bible doesn't say how old, you know, how long was Adam and Eve in the garden? We don't know. 
It's okay. <laughs> we don't have to know. And as a matter of fact, we can learn a lot from what the Bible doesn't say just as much as what it does say. For example, the story of Cain and Abel. We do not know a lot about Cain or Abel, do we? It's a very short snippet in the Bible. And, you know, we don't know how old they were. We don't know what they looked like, what color hair they had. We don't know what their favorite food was. Um, we don't know if Adam and Eve liked one over the other. We don't know that. Uh, the big, as a matter of fact, the only dialogue that we have during that story is between God and Cain, right? And so there's a lot we don't know, and it's on purpose, I believe. I believe this is on purpose. Um, when you put together the details that the author, Moses, did put in the story, you realize that the Holy Spirit was guiding Moses to write about the Messiah. Have you ever noticed that in the story of Cain and Abel? The Lord accepted Abel's offering and rejected his brother's. Because of this, Cain became jealous of his brother and killed him. Starting to sound like the gospel. Cain then lies to God and says he doesn't know where Abel is. So instead of killing Cain, the Lord cast him out from the land where he was living with his mother and father and made him wander around the nations. And he was never able to fit in. He was a vagabond wherever he went. And God, but... There's this dissonance of God looks after him and doesn't let anybody kill him. He, see, he marks him so that nobody, to protect him, and he doesn't let anybody kill him. And he says, I will judge harshly any nation that tries to harm you. Is this starting to sound like the Jews? Can you see the prophetic nature of this? And we only get this because of what we don't know about Cain and Abel, right? Jesus is rejected by his brothers, the Jews. And because of this, Jerusalem was basically obliterated in 70 A.D. We call it the Jewish diaspora. It was a big deal. And they were cast out to wander the nations of the world for 2,000 years. They didn't get to go back to their promised land. Never having a land of their own, they were being persecuted over and over and over again. Not just by the Nazis, but by a lot of people for a long time. Yet God protected them with the mark of his promises. He had promises for Israel, and he still has promises for Israel. One day we're going to go over this prophecy of the, the Valley of Dry Bones. I can't wait to share that with you, because that's something that happened in, in a lot of our lifetimes. And whether it was Egypt or Babylon or, or Germany in the Holocaust... God delivered the Jews over and over and over again and executed judgment on the nations that held them captive. Until 1948, when the United Nations came together for the very first time and they gave the Jews back the promised land. It was amazing. Unprecedented in human history. Cain and Abel. All the way back in Cain and Abel is talking about this stuff. So don't be afraid to learn from the Bible where it's silent just as much as where it is saying things. Sometimes when there's not a information there, it's on purpose. It's not for us to try to fill in the gaps with our experiences. So, one last thing I want to talk about. If you don't come across something that you don't understand fully, just put a pin in it. Um, this, is, um, this is what I do. There's been many things throughout my life where I didn't understand, like uh, when they were questioning John the Baptist, are you the prophet? The prophet? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? I was like, who, the, who is the prophet? <laughs> For years, I had no idea what they were talking about until I read Deuteronomy 18, the one that I shared with you last time I spoke, um, the test of a prophet. They were looking for a prophet like Moses. And they were asking John the Baptist, are you the prophet that, that's supposed to come like Moses? We understand that it was Jesus he was not only the Savior, he was the prophet that was like Moses. Um, but if you don't understand something, put a pin in it. Um, don't be scared to just say, I don't know what that means. I don't know. It's okay. You don't have to get everything figured out right now. It'll come to you. Just keep reading the scriptures, and, and, and I guarantee later on down the road, there's going to be something you read that makes that thing over there that you haven't thought about in forever make sense. 
And it's okay. Have, have, have faith. God's going to, he, he can teach you that way. What if there's a disagreement? This is my last point. What if there's a disagreement between us here? And I'm not just talking about Christians in general, which I am, but I'm also talking about here on Wednesday nights in this church. What, what if we have disagreements? What do we do? I want, to, I want us to keep a couple of verses in mind. And this is one. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, this is Paul speaking, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness, with lowliness, and with gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in a bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is all of our fathers. We are brothers and sisters. You see that, right? Above all and through all and in you all. When we look at each other, we can't look at each other like the world looks at each other. We can't be that way. If we hear something that we disagree with, then instead of handling it like the world does, which is separate, then go to war, right? And try to win that war. <laughs> we need to come to one another with the words of our Father in our hands, in the same spirit, and in love, trying to find precious truth together. And keep in mind how the Pharisees, the biblical scholars of the time, treated Jesus, who was considerably, not only considerably younger than them, but seemingly less educated than they were. Right? Because he wasn't a Pharisee. He was a, he was a carpenter or a stonemason or whatever you want. He worked with his hands. When he said things that they didn't agree with or understand, what did they do? They crucified him, didn't they? It was the sinners who came and talked with Jesus, and in their humility, he revealed himself to them. Think of the woman at the well, five times divorced, right? First person he ever admitted, yeah, I'm the Messiah. It's beautiful. And let us not allow ourselves to get puffed up while we're talking about studying the Bible. There's always this temptation of, oh, I got it. I understand the meaning. I'm right, and I know I'm right. And you might be. But don't let, it get, don't let it puff us up towards one another in searching for the truths in God's Word. But instead, let us use it to, to encourage each other. Don't let it puff you up. So to wrap it up and recap what we learned tonight, we learned a few things, didn't we? I know it's a lot. Let's sharpen our skills when it comes to studying the Word of God. Let's, let's look at it as a skill that we can get better at. Um, exegetically studying the Bible in order to draw out what the author was trying to say in the Spirit. Not only us, but understanding that the authors were in the Spirit. Instead of making Scripture a reflection of what we want it to say in our flesh. Remember to put everything in the correct context when you're studying a passage, speak when the Bible speaks, stay silent when the Bible is silent. When we come across something for us to disagree with one another, let us look at that as an opportunity to find the truth together and not be content with settling with this mindset of, oh, well, that's your truth. I've got my truth. That's the world. Let's just create more denominations. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> That's, that's the world. If anybody knows me in any kind of way, they know I got beef with the denom denominations. But keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Not sacrificing the truth of God's Word, just sacrificing our pride so that we can exercise grace with one another and that will glorify our Father together. Not from being right, but exercising grace. 
Because he loved us before we loved him, he loved us in our ignorance when we, when we weren't right so that he could reveal himself to us. Let's love each other the same way so that we can find the Lord the accurate way together. I want to finish tonight's teaching with two passages. And you're like, oh my God. And I'm like, oh my goodness. I know it's long. I know it's long. You can blame Joyce. I've been trying to count my words, right? You know, trying to time it. It's tough. I want to start, I want to end off with these two passages. You like, you like my uh, hermeneutics picture? Cute, right? <laughs> First John 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Who is them? Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He said that a couple of verses earlier. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world. And the world hears them. We are of God. He knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. We can tell the spirit of truth and error now. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. In this, the love of God is manifest towards us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. In this, in the gospel, in this message, is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So if we have disagreements, keep this one in mind. This is a good one to keep in mind. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. And you're like, whoa, 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to read the whole chapter? Yup. Here we go. It's only 13 verses. <laughs> Though I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, right? We're studying prophecy on Wednesday nights. Even if we understand it all, even if we get all through the whole Old Testament and we understand all the prophecies and understand all the mysteries and we have all knowledge. And though I have all faith that I could move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Keep that in mind when starting talking about hermeneutics. <laughs> and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, I'm a good person. And though I give my body to be burned, I'm a martyr. And have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love doesn't envy. Love doesn't parade itself and it's not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they're going to cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. All the hermeneutics, all the things we learn, understand that one day it's going to be gone. That doesn't mean it doesn't benefit us now, but understand where it is in, this, in the picture of things. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. One of the most misquoted verses in the entire Bible, in my opinion. There's a reason it's smack dab in the middle of the love chapter. That means children don't know how to love, but men do. I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. 
Now I know in part. But then I shall know just as I am known. And now abide. And now, right now, before Jesus comes back, we abide these three things. Faith, hope, and love. These three things. But the greatest of these is love. We can understand hermeneutics. We can understand context. We can be 100% right. But without this idea of the bond of unity in peace with our brothers and sisters in Christ through love, it means nothing. It doesn't mean anything. That's not me saying that. You get that, right? Uh, I want to give you a tool. It's like a, a, a minute long video. And uh, this is about the Blue Letter Bible app. This is what I use. And for those of you who are new to the Blue Letter Bible, let's talk for a moment about what this site is all about. The intended goal of the BLB is to enhance your natural Bible study methods by providing an array of tools that are intrinsically linked to the Bible itself. It's free. That, of course, way. is PR gobbledygook. So let's use a quick example to show you what we mean. Let's say you are trying to study John 1.1. 1, 1. You can look at an interlinear representation of John 1.1 1, 1, with the Greek attached to its associated English translation via Strong's numbers. You can click on any Strong's number and see the lexicon entry for that word, which contains grammatical information, definitions of the word, and all the places that Greek or Hebrew term appears in scripture, no matter how it's translated into English. Also, from each verse, you can see how that passage is translated across a number of versions, find corresponding passages throughout scripture, and access related commentaries, audio messages, charts, and other tools. And every verse has its own content, giving you a lot of different directions to move or be moved in while you study God's word. So the next real question here is, how do I get to the Bible? We'll address that in the next video. We won't, but you can if you want. So yeah, um, I'm going to pray. I hope, I hope you guys go and check out Blue Letter Bible. That's what I use for all my Bible studies. Free commentaries on there. It's all completely free. Um, you can look up all of the different, like he just said, go and mess with it. Um, it, will, it will totally up your game in the Bible study. When you're like, huh, I want to study this word, and then you've got this whole huge, uh, what do you call it, Strong's Concordance. You're like, oh my gosh, i got to find this word. Uh, well, uh, this, you can do it so fast. You do, I mean, it's amazing. It's great. I, I recommend it. But let's pray, and then I'll, uh, I'll let you guys ask questions, or if you have anything you want to say, we can, we can do that. Father God, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for these people that come and study your word with me. Um, I pray that you, you make us fruitful, and... Make us strong, not only in order to spread the gospel for your sake, but so that we can live holy lives for you. I love you, Father, and it's in your son's name I pray. Amen.